So I'm going to be giving um, a little whistle-stop historical tour of the last 400 years in 10 minutes. It should be absolutely fine, I'm sure. And what I hope to do is to show how science and spirituality have evolved in complementary fashion uh, uh, in, in, in parallel and have interacted over their course and in so doing to show that they are natural friends and certainly not in conflict or enemies. Um, over the course of the talk, hopefully what I mean by the term spirituality will become clear and will emerge. And with each idea I give, because I'll have to give it so briefly, I shall also give you the name of a book which you can read if you would like to know more about that particular concept. So to start off, the reason why science and spirituality are naturally complementary, is that they both have their source, they have a common source in the modern ethos and in modernity. And modernity is a very complex idea, but I shall boil it down to a few points. And that is first the belief that the future can be better than the past. We take that for granted now, but in the pre-modern world there was a deeply held assumption that the past was perfect and the present was imperfect and the future was getting more and more imperfect. And indeed that the greats of antiquity from Abraham and Moses to Plato and Aristotle were super beings that we simply could defer to in their greatness but never emulate. That was a deeply held assumption and that we were falling away from that state of perfection. And with this new belief that you could actually create a better future was a belief that you could question authority and tradition, that they were fallible and not conduits to that perfect past. And this created a rebellious spirit, as well as a spirit that individuals could uh, innovate and have the freedom to experiment and try new things, and that just one person could potentially improve on the collective products of the past. That, of course is a considerable hubris to believe that one person can do better than the weight of tradition, but that's the essence of modernity, and we still hold that true. And with individualism comes more pluralism, a society where there's far more diversity than in a society which is held together by tradition. And the book that I strongly recommend if you're interested in modernity as an idea is called Ancients and Moderns by Richard Foster Jones, and he traces it to the mid-17th century and I would agree with that, that it's in the mid-1600s that you see modernity go mainstream and you see these ideas becoming a cultural norm. Now, out of modernity, uh, it is well known and well agreed that we had a variety of revolutions as the rebellious spirit kicked off a host of changes and revolutions in all walks of life. And those, of course, are in the scientific domain, uh, uh, but also, and perhaps less often referred to were a series of revolutions in the spiritual domain, and I'm going to have a quick look at those advancing in parallel from 1600 to now, and I'm going to select a few revolutions that happened in parallel to illustrate what I mean. Firstly, the original scientific revolution, which was spurred in the late, 16th, late 17th century by the discoveries of Newton, the founding of the Royal Society, whose motto is uh, nullius in verba, which means take nobody's word for it. And that captures perfectly the rebellious spirit of modernity. And a variety of, uh, of innovations and uh, discoveries also advanced at the time with telescopes, microscopes, mercury thermometers, and indeed the founding of the observatory at Greenwich, which is close to me in my university. And uh, if you're interested in the scientific revolution, the original, I strongly recommend the scientific revolution by Stephen Shapin. But at the same time, at exactly the same time, there was the nonconformist revolution going on in religion. Dissenting groups challenging religion as it had been done in the past and saying, no, we're going to take nobody's word for it as well. We're going to take that motto and apply it to religion and show that there are new radical ways of being spiritual. And they have wonderful names such as the Seekers and Shakers and Ranters. And of course, the Quakers, who have remained uh, that, that showed, shown the greatest longevity of those early nonconformist sects. And, of course, their lack of priests rec uh, reflects their rebelliousness and their dislike of authority and hierarchy. And this was basically a, a perfect parallel to what was going on in science at the time. And I, again, strongly recommend The World Turned Upside Down by Christopher Hill if you're interested in those early nonconformist uh, revolutions. So if we fast forward 100 years... 
There was a second scientific revolution, uh, and a major part of it was called the chemical revolution, which is where chemistry caught up with physics and early zoology and started to show itself a serious player in science. And so figures such as Antoine Lavoisier and Joseph Priestley, who uh, threw out the old four-element theory of air, water, earth, and fire, and created the theory of elements that we now know. And that was pioneered then, and the periodic table started to take shape. They discovered oxygen and hydrogen and more. And a wonderful book I recommend to refer to the chemical revolution is The Age of Wonder by Richard Holmes, that I'm sure some of you have read, and captures that spirit of the mid-1700s, the mid-18th century, and the science going on then. And at the same time, there was a parallel spiritual revolution, the Romantic Revolution. A uh, fabulous book to refer to that is The Romantic Revolution by Professor Tim Blanning. And The Romantic Revolution was a revolution that really took as its goal to complement science by looking at the mysteries of the inner world while science looked out, by looking at feelings rather than thoughts and rationality, particularly as a basis for moral behavior, the importance of feeling and sensibility as a basis of morality. And also nature as a kind of divine canvas, a kind of mirror of God, rather than as mechanism. There was much give and take between romanticism and science at the time, but uh, it was a distinct trajectory and very spiritual at its core, very mystical. And the, particularly the idea that through art and poetry and music, you could have spiritual experiences even though that art or musical poetry may have no religious content at all, but simply by showing nature in all its glory, you could have a spiritual experience. And that was the essence of Romanticism. And that carried on. And fast forwarding to my next selected revolution, jumping over many, the Quantum Revolution, and a fabulous book on that is Erwin Schrodinger and the Quantum Revolution by John Gribbin. And the quantum revolution was the opening of science to the subatomic world and realizing that at the very smallest level of reality, there is profound uh, weirdness, to use a technical term, and deep mystery. And the fact that things which appear seamless, in fact, occur in packets. So even light is contained in quanta, in little discrete packets, which we now refer to as photons. Max Planck discovery of that initiated the, the quantum revolution, and Schrodinger then found that Light was not just photons, it was both wave and particle, and again open science to the idea of paradox, that light could be both wave and particle, and that we had to accept that fabulous paradox in the fundaments of reality. And at the same time as the quantum revolution was happening, there was a parallel spiritual revolution opening up to uncertainty in religion in the interfaith revolution. And this was... Uh, symbolized by the world's parliament of religions that met for the first time in 1893 and brought for the first time representatives of East and Western faiths together, the, the first formal occasion where that had happened. And from that, there was much dialogue and out of that emerged the idea that perhaps the common denominator behind religion was something that transcended religion something experiential, mystical, and spiritual. It had distinct romantic and nonconformist undertones, because there was a lineage there. And the idea that perhaps mysticism is the, is the thing which could bind us together rather than theology in words. So a wonderful book I recommend on that period is Restless Souls by Leah Eric Schmidt. And I could have also mentioned Mysticism by uh, Evelyn Underhill or The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James, also looking at this new idea, really, the word mysticism was new then, that mysticism may be the answer. Fast forwarding again, selecting a next revolution from the scientific side, we have the current cosmology revolution, a, a term that I uh, use specifically because it was referred to by a Michio Kaku, a well-known cosmologist and string theorist, and his fabulous book Parallel Worlds is a wonderful lay introduction to the extraordinary uh, and uh, mysterious aspects of current cosmology. And he refers to the revolution both in the amount of evidence that's accruing for uh, the Big Bang and the inflationary theory, but also that there are things which we fundamentally don't understand yet, such as the fact that inflation is speeding up, posited dark energy to account for that, but we really don't know what that is, and the fact of dark matter, which we don't know uh, what that is either. In fact, it seems that in cosmology at the moment, if you don't understand something call it dark. 
And at the same time as the cosmology revolution has been happening, we've seen the spirituality revolution since the 1970s. Fabulous book on that is The Spirituality Revolution by David Tacey. And that refers to the fact that since the 1970s, there's been an enormous upwelling of spirituality in the world. And so we've gone from a matter of uh, maybe 20% of people in the West reporting spiritual experience to over 75% in, uh, in, a short, in a short space of time. This is a huge upwelling. In fact, Tacey refers to it as a flood. So how are these complementary? Well, the scientific has throughout emphasized the empirical, the measurable, the verbal, what can be put in language and mathematics, and the rational, what can be put in ratio in bits and pieces. While spirituality has focused on the non-empirical, the non-verbal, and the non-rational, not irrational. Uh, in other words, the transcendent, the ineffable, and the intuitive. There is much overlap, and they are perfectly complementary. Thank you very much.